Steve here. Before we start the show, I just wanted to let you know that you can now support Rootbound on Patreon. Learn how, plus more ways to support the podcast at rootboundpodcast.com slash support. Now, on with the show. You are listening to Rootbound, a podcast about plants for when you're stuck inside. This episode of Rootbound is brought to you by figs, the only fruit that's full of wasps. Figs, now with 50% more wasps. Hello, everybody. Thank you for listening to this episode of Rootbound. I'm your host, Steve. And each week on Rootbound, I invite a guest who tells me about a plant that means something to them. And then I tell the guest about a plant that means something to me. And through this process, we can all learn more about plants and learn more about each other. It's the philosophy of Rootbound that everybody has a plant that means something to them if you just think about it for a little bit. So I wonder what that plant is for you. Now, before we meet our guest today, I've been thinking about moss. And as you'll hear in a little bit, I was kind of tricked into thinking about moss, but I've been thinking about moss nonetheless. And I was kind of curious, like, what defines moss? So I first went to Wikipedia, like you do, and uh, I think I understand moss a little bit more. And there's a number of things that that make moss moss, but one of the primary characteristics of moss is that it is a non-vascular plant. And to understand a non-vascular plant, we need to understand what a vascular plant is. Now, vascular plants are, are most of the plants I think we think of when we think of plants. So most food crops, trees, ornamental flowers, and things like that are vascular plants. And these are plants that have a vascular system, vascular tissue that conducts a material called xylem, which is mostly water, bringing water up from the roots to the rest of the plant, and another material called phloem, which conducts the materials of photosynthesis down from the leaves to the rest of the plant, and xylem and phloem are also otherwise known as sap. And this system of transport of materials through this vascular system allows the plant uh, to grow taller and to be more rigid and, 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 and as well as be more efficient in the way that it transfers um, nutrients and water around. Um, but moss does not have that vascular system, and therefore it cannot grow as tall, and that's why moss is so tiny. So uh, there's more that makes moss moss, but that was my main takeaway when I was researching it. So now you know a little bit more about moss, and we're going to talk to our guest, not about moss, as you will see. So we still have an opening for the first moss to be covered on Rootbound. So if that's you, if you have some moss that is meaningful to you, reach out, rootboundpodcast at gmail.com. And with that said, let's meet our guest. Whatever it was, the subject of plant life was now beginning to take on a strong and macabre interest. Hi, Stefan. Welcome to Rootbound. Steve, good to be here. Good to have you. Uh, Do you have a plant to share with us today? I do. Uh, my plant today is Spanish moss. Awesome. I think you have the um, the accomplishment here of being the first moss on the podcast, so congratulations. Oh. Well, there is still an open slot for that, actually, because Spanish oh. moss is not actually a moss. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, that was a <laughs> twist I was not expecting. Yeah. So it's, awesome. Um, Please. Yeah. Anyway, it's so uh, that that spot's still open for someone in the future. But there's some qualities about it that has moss-like qualities, but it's actually not in the moss family at all. Interesting. Um, maybe before we get into that, because I'm very curious about that. But maybe first, why did you choose Spanish moss? Why is Spanish moss meaningful to you? So, Spanish moss is something that I think I first discovered when early on when we used to play in New Orleans, um, down south in Louisiana. And I just remember the beauty of the forest down there. The trees, there was something different. And what it was, it was that there was this stringy, sort of light blue grayish plant hanging from the trees. 
And it just created this sort of mystique and almost a magical feeling. And ever since then, I've just always loved Spanish moss, but I'm not around it very often. I live out west and we don't have Spanish moss out here. Um, it really is, doesn't grow much north of Virginia. And so it's a specific place in the country. It has to be really humid for it to grow. So it's, um, it's one of those things you don't see very often. So where I, when I'm someplace where I do see it, it's like I go, oh, yes, I forgot. There's Spanish moss. It's an amazing, amazing plant. Um, and visually, it's just I'm a photographer as a hobbyist. And um, it's it's one of those things that as a photographer, you just it's a great thing to um, take photos of. Very cool. Yeah, I have a little bit of photography background, too. And just I, you know, I feel like I haven't been around it very much. But just seeing you sent me a picture on text uh, the other day or yesterday. And I think there is something about that uh, the gravity aspect of it, right? Especially when, when when most plants and trees have a little bit more of this like uh, uh, non-directionality to them. Sure. The fact that you have this stuff like hanging very evenly gives it this nice photographic quality. Yeah, and it's um, lighter than the tree itself. And so in places in the South, like um, in Charleston area or New Orleans or places where if they have events where there's where they're having an event where there's trees with Spanish moss, if you light up those trees, the Spanish moss lights up particularly brighter than the trees or the leaves. So it cre- they and it um, the color connects to it, you know, better. So it'll be like say there's purple light up on the tree. Well, the light will the tree will be this dark sort of shape, you know. But from that is this bright purple stringy oh. plant hanging off of it so it's really easy to make it kind of um, manipulate it and um yeah so just it's visually it's you know it's killer very cool well uh did you bring any fun facts or dazzling details to share with us about spanish moss well do you want to know the scientific name first i know yes i love something scientific names. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> the scientific name is interesting um talanzia usniodes Wow. Sometimes I, have a, sometimes I have a little bit of an inkling of what words mean in, in scientific names. This time yeah. I have none. <laughs> so this is a funny scientific name to, for me because Talanzia, it was, um, he was named, so the guy who named this plant, I guess they were naming plants in the early 1700s around that time. Yeah. And this plant was named by someone who was told that this plant only grew in dry areas. Okay. Which is the opposite, right? But yeah, yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. he was told. I don't know. He obviously wasn't there at where the plant was when he was naming it. So he knew a professor named uh, Talanzia, Mr. Talanzia. Mm-hmm. And this guy was deathly afraid of water. And there, for wherever this guy lived, he would rather walk 100 miles than take a 20-minute boat ride across okay. a river, across a creek. He He was frightened. I was, you know, just very scared. And so this guy named the plant after this professor he knew because this professor was afraid of water and he think this plant only grew in dry areas. So the (laughs) second part, that's the first part of the name, Talanzia, which is just weird. The second part, Usnidos, uh, Usnidos, I'm sorry, I'm totally butchering it. Yeah, yeah. Usnidos. Usniodis. Usniodis is actually it's just it's it means like another plant, like another type of lichen that was called like nodis. And so oh, okay. so the, the first part of the name scientific name is based off this guy who is afraid of water. And the second part is it because it looks like this other plant. So <laughs> it's weird, right? So Spanish yeah, moss. Yeah, yeah. So, so this poor plant has a name, Spanish moss. It's not from Spain and it's not a moss. <laughs> the scientific name was, it was given was uh-huh. because the guy who named it thought the guy who was naming it after was, you know, afraid of water. So this plant who grew only in dry areas, you know, made sense. So this poor plant um, really doesn't have a name that is very, um, you know, sort of, tells you what it is <laughs> that just... is so funny that, that's happened a few other times in the show and actually just 
a little preview. M- my plant also has kind of a funny story behind its Latin name, which is incorrect. So that's that's a fun theme on this episode. Yeah, I mean, it's for I learned so much about just the name itself, Spanish moss, and that that kind of came from um, a couple different stories and legends. There's all these stories, and of course. One thing I learned learning about Spanish moss is that it's been a really long time since I've researched anything <laughs> uh, like in the way of like a high school report or something uh-huh. like that, you know. And nowadays you just you don't know what you're being told if it's true, some of the references are interesting. So I have a few different like stories of different legends of Spanish moss. None of them I'm sure necessarily are really true or not. There's some from there's um a Cajun Okay, so there's a Cajun story, and supposedly, if you don't know, Cajuns were, um, they were the French uh, settlers down in New Orleans who settled outside of New Orleans. Uh, they, are the, they are in the swamps. Yeah, and- actually, actually, this I, I actually need to see more Spanish moss, because actually my dad's side of the family has a deep Cajun connection, oh. um, and I, you know, I grew up in Texas, but in, in Dallas, but that side of the family is from Southeast Texas near the border of Louisiana. And it's right. that kind of territory. And, uh, but I, I never spent a ton of time down there. It's something I've been wanting to reconnect with a bit. Is that Cajun heritage I have? It's, I mean, I way back, I went for a swamp trip. Um, when I was recording, we, we, we made an album in new Orleans. So I got a good, lot of good time down there and oh, I took cool. a, a swamp trip about two hours outside of New Orleans. And um, our guide was, there was Spanish moss everywhere. And it was amazing. And our guide was explaining just how, when there's Spanish moss around, you know the ecosystem's working, the climate's, mm. the climate's good, the pollution's good. And everyone thought, you know, you think of swamp, you think of like muck and mud and, and, and unclean. But actually the swamp is really clean area sort of a side tangent but, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, interesting but that was one of my first you know um my memories of of being around someone who knew something about spanish moss and because new orleans doesn't have any more spanish moss oh wow it used to line the streets it used to be all over the french quarter all over the big oaks um but yeah so no more down in new orleans and the main town now outside and around certain areas you can find it still but maybe maybe we'll get back to why that is i think maybe you have sure some facts about that but let's yeah. move back to i interrupted you yeah. about the the, Cajun about the legends the legend Cajun legends of, so yes. there's um so let's see there's um this is another big name but so the chaka indians um in that area and the cajuns sort of connected a lot and they shared a lot of stories and a lot of the same practices. Um, this is also the area where voodoo comes from. And so there's also the African American slave element that, um, comes into play with this area. But, um, these people believed they were, they believed in ghosts. They believe in spirits. They believed in medicinal medicines from plants and magic from plants. Um, so they had this, um, character in the woods who was called um, Le Père de Mille Feuillets, which means the father of a thousand leaves. Wow. And this guy was like this god kind of beast who walked through the woods. And um, he had a, a daughter. And this daughter was to be wed eventually to a Spaniard guard named Captain Henri- Hen- uh, Henriquez. And Captain Henriquez and this girl got married. But when they got married on their wedding night, a jealous lover um, murdered this poor girl. And in doing so, the captain wanted to bury, he was Christian. He wanted to bury the daughter, his his wife, the, um, the, the princess in the ground by this old oak tree. But the father of the daughter who was a spirit wanted her to be closer to this um this the spirit in the sky so as a compromise supposedly he buried her body but then took her hair and threw her hair up in the trees oh wow and the hair kept growing and it was that's the story of spanish moss from the cajuns 
there. The other story. So yeah, so that one has it where the Spanish, the guy was okay. Like they got married. It was kind of a, not a great story, but there was love in it. Right. Mm -hmm. Now the other story comes from um, the Kusabu Indian tribe there. And their, their legend is there was a Spanish pirate. Uh, Spanish pirates were not very nice. And this, (sighs) this particular pirate had a huge beard, big black beard down to his gut. And he saw um, an Indian princess there and he wanted, he decided he wanted her. So he chased her and she ran and she ran to this old Oak tree, climbed up the Oak tree. And so he kept climbing the Oak tree up with her. When she got to the top of the Oak tree, there's a sh- creek that she knew of. She jumped off the oak tree, landed in the creek, swam away. She was okay. Now, the pirate, he tried to jump off the tree also into the creek, but because his beard was so big, his the branches of the oak caught his, caught his beard, and he was stuck. So he fell off. He eventually died hanging from the tree, but his beard kept growing and kept growing and kept growing, becoming Spanish moss. Um, and they say, and this is true. I have some Spanish moss right here oh, and wow. I bought some, you can get some actually now online, but inside Spanish moss is like a little bit of black filament, like a little tiny piece of black, like almost hair. So the story was that if you opened up Spanish moss, you could still see the pirate's hair, which is oh, true. Wow. Oh, cool. <laughs> so Yeah. That's- well, it's got a lot of mystery around it, this plant. Yeah. Very interesting. So I'm very curious now, after these cool myths and also from the beginning of the show, that it is not a moss. Yeah. What is it? It's an epiphyte. Oh, I learned that word a few episodes ago when we were talking about the ficus genus, which are the figs, and there's many fig plants that are yes. also epiphytes. Interesting. I yeah. didn't know that. So I, just for our audience, if they haven't listened to the episode, could you define epiphyte sure. for us? So an epiphyte is a plant that gets its nutrients from air and also from the surface area of whatever plant it's on. It's non-parasitic, but it grows on other plants. And so it, it has a, a relationship with another plant. And Spanish moss has relationships with the trees that it, it grows on, but it doesn't grow into the tree. There's no roots. Um, and it just hangs on the tree. The only way it could really hurt the tree is if it gets super wet, it can break branches sometimes, Mm -hmm. the weight of it, or shading from it can cause other leaves not to be able to have photosynthesis. I see, I see. So, yeah, so, but overall, it's, it picks, for some reason, it likes the older dying oaks, Hmm. um, and there's like swamp ash I think it likes, there are other trees, but the oaks are the ones that it's known for. So it collects the dying cells from the oak tree and absorbs it into its own plant and survives. And then, wow, yeah, I mean, and when it, and when it, it the, dandy, the seeds are a little bit like dandelion seeds. So they have these little seed puffs, oh, wow. and they blow off, catch on to other trees, and uh, go for it. Yeah. Super fascinating. So wow. yeah, epiphyte. Um, orchids are epiphytes. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, and um, but they and have then, root systems. Now, this uh, Spanish moss has no root system. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, the other epiphytes I think about is like when you hear the word air plant, which is popular. A lot, sure. A lot, like, those are like I think maybe the most common epiphytes that people think of because they don't have. They're not. Their roots aren't in the soil. They're exposed to the air. Or in the case yeah. of Spanish moss, does not have roots, which is very interesting. Yeah, so exactly. And it's also part of the um bromelade family. Oh, okay. which wow. is the same as pineapples. <laughs> oh, very cool. Yeah. Uh sometimes those families when cuz you know there's a uh, species genus family. And sometimes the families you hear about plants are in the same family like, yeah, oh that makes sense. And sometimes you're like pineapples and Spanish moss. I right. could could have figured. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Totally yeah. doesn't make sense, but yeah. it's true. Very interesting. Um, I don't know if you want to get into now. I, I'm very curious about the, you mentioned about uh, them being a sign of of a good ecosystem and then perhaps mm-hmm. why 
the there isn't Spanish moss in New Orleans anymore, or like what what is the process like that causes them to have trouble growing in places? Yeah, so I don't know if you remember or ever saw the movie Benjamin Button. Yes, I believe they they in their scenes of downtown New Orleans during the gaslight light era, mm-hmm. there's beautiful trees with Spanish moss in mm-hmm. those scenes. Um, and then since then, now they're not there anymore. Spanish moss is really susceptible to air pollution. Mm. Um, and particularly, it seems like areas near roadways that are heavier trafficked. Hmm. When I was, I stayed in like down in Palmetto Bluffs this last tour. Mm-hmm. And that's an area that has a that's near near Savannah, Georgia, mm-hmm. which is known for like the scenery and sort of quote unquote old South kind uh-huh. of um, scenery. And the the so when I was there, I was kind of near the coast where I was staying, mm-hmm. and the roads back there was were beautiful, like little roads through just like old oaks and the Spanish moss hanging over you. But then as you got closer and closer to the main hi- main highway and the throughways and stuff, I noticed uh, the trees were gone. There's no more Spanish moss. They just mm. weren't there. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, they really do seem to, uh, it really is a plant that seems to not survive well when there's air pollution. And particularly, it seems like air pollution caused by vehicles. Interesting. I've looked there's up... A- yeah, I tried oh, to research ahead, a little. Sorry, I tried to research a little more about um, like studies. There were some studies done, and it, it all gets a little bit too scientific for me. <laughs> but it's <laughs> yeah, obvious that they used to be there in the bigger cities, and now they're not. Yeah, there's a concept. Well, actually, I don't think this concept has come up on the show yet. But there's a concept, uh, and it, it applies to both plants and also animals of an indicator species. Right, it's a mm-hmm. species of of plant or animal that that indicates something, and generally indicating a a uh, healthy environment. And so mm-hmm. that's interesting. I didn't know that uh, Spanish moss was that, but it makes sense because generally those indicator species are ones that are maybe a bit more sensitive and also very, uh, very obvious, right? Because people don't notice the the plants and animals that are gone if they're not that obvious, but there's these certain ones that I can, can help us kind of see easier what's going on with the environment. So that's very interesting. Yeah, I, one thing I did see a lot when I was researching was a lot of people going like, look, Spanish moss is growing here. I have good air. Like, I can know uh-huh. I can breathe well. Like, you just, it's sort of an indicator that where you live, the air is pretty pure. Um, and in the swamps outside New Orleans and other places around the south where there where there's good ecosystems, um, the water will be, like, really clean, even though it's dark, but mm-hmm. it's actually really super clear. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, there's usually tons of Spanish moss hanging. Very fascinating. Uh, well, do you have any other fun facts or dazzling details about Spanish moss we missed? Yeah, you know, there's, there's a couple interesting. We're just, we're talking about location of it. And I, so I saw that does in Brazil, Spanish moss was, grew in Brazil. There's hmm. some, um, there was some stories uh, about, like medicinal uses that um, that Brazilians used to use of, for Spanish moss. And so it grows pretty much from like, say, bottom of Virginia all the mm-hmm. way down to sort of the top of Chile and Argentina. Oh, wow. So that whole space in these super coastal humid areas. Mm-hmm. But what's interesting to me is that it doesn't grow in the Amazon jungle. Because oh, it yeah. does grow in really humid places, but it doesn't grow in the Amazon I'm not sure why. I know in Hawaii and Australia, it was introduced uh-huh. and it grows well there in places. So it's something that can be introduced to other places also. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so I just thought that was interesting that it Very actually was, wasn't in, didn't grow in the Amazon. Yeah. I wonder why that is. Uh, audience, if you have any clues to that, feel free to send a message because yeah, that's, that's pretty interesting because that's yeah. a humid place. Yeah. Yeah. And I was wondering, maybe the trees are too high. I don't know if that's oh, something. Oh, that, that's... That's an you interesting know? point. I could also see maybe if I were going to speculate uh, that maybe it needs more airflow that happens in such mm-hmm. a dense jungle. Maybe it needs to be a little bit more spread out, but that's yep. just pure yeah. speculation. Yeah. I mean, if you ever get a chance to, like, this is totally off subject, but if you get a chance to, just if you're ever in a forest where there's lots of Spanish moss and it's a little breezy and windy, 
there's also another sound that comes along with it that you're, you're used to the tree sounds of trees. I mean, the leaves, you know, you hear the yeah. leaves through the wind, but then you have this Spanish moss and it's like this. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. It's wild. It's oh, so wow. cool. Man. Yeah. I, w- I wonder if I can find a recording of that. That'd be great for a podcast. <laughs> yeah. I actually looked and there was some, but mostly it's just like you hear the wind. <laughs> yeah. You got to do it. You got to have a really good recording setup. Yeah. Too, right. I yeah. Think. Yeah. Yeah. There's some, you know, it's interesting. I, I started to, look into uh like medicinal uses or mm-hmm. see if if spanish moss because right now so spanish moss in the let's see it was in the 1930s 1970 uh it was used actually for industry mm. and oh, wow so yeah so they your mind's gonna be blown so <laughs> vehicles uh upholstery furniture all that stuff was stuffed with spanish moss Whoa. back then spanish moss had it because it, it's just it has like a spongy quality to it, uh-huh. um, and that's what they used. They used it, and then after after other materials came into play, Spanish moss wasn't really the best option anymore. But it was um, harvested on a, on a commercial level up until about 1970, Whoa. and so now it's all just mostly for garden um, and plant arrangements and like nurseries and stuff. So there's small batch retailers right now, mm-hmm. but really all really pretty small. Um, it's for like decorative use. Decorative use. Yeah. It's good for like I have right here. Um, I'll show you one sec. Oh, a terrarium. That's awesome. Wow. There's like a little like glass bulb with some fun, fun various plants in it. That's cool. So this terrarium I had, it, has, it had, it used to have more plants, but right now the fern is still doing pretty good. And I got this Spanish moss from um, this, I don't know where it's, it says it's from the U.S., but it's called preserved Spanish moss, which is weird. So I think they colored it because oh, it's super green. Uh-huh, interesting. Now, Spanish moss does have little green tips uh-huh. that are actually edible, but they're so small. So you never really get it that green. Mm-hmm. But I wanted to try putting it in the bottom because I've been having problem like keeping moisture in this thing Uh and so spanish moss is supposed to hold moisture and for longer so a lot of people use spanish moss in their plant arrangements to retain water for the soil very cool is is a terrarium is that a thing that you've gotten into this is one i just happened to find it and i Uh I mean i i'm i got the actual like glass piece and everything and then um i i planted the plants there about two years ago Oh, wow. And it, for a while, it was killing. And then, yeah, there's just the ferns, the only thing that's kept going. I want to get into to terrariums. It seems like a cool hobby to, to like mess around with. It's great if you travel. You just oh, pour yeah. a, you know, a cup of water in before you go away for a month and you come back and it, it's still loving life. So Yeah, and I've seen some. There's a like really famous uh, one that I've seen on the internet about this guy who had this terrarium he had built in like, you know, 1960 and it's still like yeah. never added water to it, right? It was just like Whoa. one closed <laughs> system. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's kind of hard to pull off. But yeah, it seems like kind of cool to create this little like self-contained world. I love it. It's a good hobby. I mean, we have like my kids love planting and we have a lot of outdoor plants here because I live in California. Mm-hmm. So indoor plants, I don't have as much actually. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh but yeah, the terraniums are a lot of fun. It's a really fun hobby. Uh, and yeah, you can use Spanish moss for for the bottoms of that. Very cool. Uh, Do we miss anything from your Spanish moss list? You know, there's... A, okay, so let's see. We talked about the uses of Spanish moss, but there's also there was also some medicinal uses. And the Native Americans had different teas that they would make using Spanish moss for fever reducer. Mm. They also, it was used for wound dressing because there's it's a natural anesthetic. Let's see what else. Oh, it was also used for to ease childbirth. Oh, wow. And to um, give mothers uh, who had just had babies, they would give them the tea to sort of help promote breast milk. Fascinating. Um, wow. Yeah. And I, I looked into it. And so there's also a compound in Spanish moss called... HMG, which hmm. scientifically has been known to reduce glucose levels. Hmm. So they've looked at little bits of it for medicinal uses, but today the thing is is that there's so many other plants that have these same values that are easier to cultivate and easier to 
get these things from. So Spanish moss isn't really being used anymore for any sort of medicinal type stuff. But one thing, another another cool thing that I found out about Spanish moss that I never knew is um, uh, it was the first stuffing they used for voodoo dolls. Oh, wow. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. And it, it's Spanish moss has like this sort of magical property to it that a lot of like hoodoo, which is also voodoo, mm-hmm. um, that tradition, they used to use it a lot. They, they would wear it as like drapery to kind of in different ceremonies. Um, and I also know that, that um, certain tribes, the women would use it when they were mourning to dress mm. themselves. Mm. Um, so yeah, I thought it was pretty interesting because I just went in going, oh, it's a cool looking <laughs> moss that hangs from a tree. I want to learn a little more about it. And when you asked me, I was staying down in Georgia. I mean, I was staying in, you know, near Savannah. Uh-huh. So it was just like it was everywhere. I was like, oh, this is awesome. And since then, I'm like, wow. So another thing that I did is I was like, well, I wonder if there's any like popular culture about Spanish moss because that's uh-huh. what I'm really into. It's like, yeah. how does it relate to pop- popular culture? Is it music, yeah. TV, stuff like that? So there's this, um, first off, yes, Gordon Lightfoot, who I've heard of, but I can't say I really know too much of his music, but uh-huh. sort of a folky kind of singer. Gordon Lightfoot from his album Summertime Dream has a song called Spanish Moss. Cool. So I, ch- I suggest everyone go check that out. That, that was um, back in 1975. And then last is this uh, this show. So this uh, this show is so cool. Um, have you ever heard of Kolchek, the Night Stalker? Yeah, it rings. I've never watched it, but it rings a bell. The dad who played um, in A Christmas Story. Uh huh. I don't know if you know that movie, but yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the dad in that movie, I loved him uh, growing up. That was one of my favorite Christmas movies. And this guy's name is Darren McGavin. So anyway, Kolchek was an earlier show that he was he was like the lead character. He was like this reporter who went out and he always ended up it was kind of like X Files. Like each uh-huh. episode oh, was like cool. a different kind of sort of uh, mysterious thing that was going on that only he was like able to discover, right? Uh-huh. And uh-huh. so there's a the Spanish Moss Murders is an episode. Oh wow. And it's this and it kind of goes back to that Cajun story I told you about. But they took a play on that Cajun character and turned him into this boogeyman who wore Spanish moss who was going around killing people up in Chicago. And anyway, I won't give away too much wow. of it. Okay. Cool, cool. <laughs> but it's one of those, like, and if you're into, like, old, like, kind of, um, like, mystery thriller sitcoms and stuff like that from the 70s, you'd love this one because the camera angles, like, the shots, everything, like, where they leave you hanging, I mean, it's classic. I just I just Googled it. I'm looking at all screenshots, and it, yeah, it looks very cool. Yeah, yeah, awesome. definitely worth it. It's about 45 minutes, and it won't let you down. Does this uh, Permalfe have Spanish moss all over him? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, look, I'm going to beat the drums in here all day for you, and, uh, but you're going to talk to me. Now, just why do you call this Permalfe a boogeyman? Permalfe is supposed to come from the upper bayou regions. Yeah. He's wet, he's covered with rock, and Spanish moss. Thank you for sharing uh, Spanish moss. That was, like, awesome information. I, I'm definitely going to try to go seek out some. I, I got to go a little further south, I, I guess, than where I am now. But I think uh, so. Do you, do you mind if I share a plant with you? I love it. Awesome. Um. So, so my plant, you know, that's one of the big challenges of the show is I got to pick a new plant every week. It's like the, 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 you know, the experience of learning about a plant, which I think uh, hopefully you had a little experience about that uh, today is, it's yeah, really oh, fun. Um, but sometimes it gets a little bit tricky about what plant I'm going to choose. And this one I chose, uh, because it is growing in my yard, but it's not one that, that I planted. It's one that kind of came up on its own. And I, I have this habit of, um, if something's growing in my yard somewhere and I don't know what it is, I just let, I will mow around it because I want to mm. see what it is. Um, and, you know, I think my neighbors are probably annoyed by that because my yard is pretty <laughs> wild. <laughs> right. um, but I was like, okay, what is this coming up? This looks, this was maybe two years ago. Um, and it, and it started off of just looking kind of like there's a term that we've covered before in the podcast called a basil rosette. So it's like a dandelion has at the base, it's like a, 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 
a, you know, it's a rose structure, a rosette. So it's like a circular pattern of leaves okay. coming out of the middle. Yeah. And it, and it has this kind of look, but then in the, f- it, later in the summer, it started to like shoot up and kind of turn into a bush. And then around uh, fall, um, it, it got covered with these tiny little white flowers. And this is when I finally could identify it because I have an app I use called Seek that you can like point at plants and it will like tell you what the plant is. like that. It's yeah. It's amazing. Um, yep. And it told me that this plant is called uh, Hairy Old Field Aster, <laughs> which is a wow. good name. For me, that yeah. sounds like a person. Like sounds like a character. Could be like a character in a Kolchak movie. <laughs> Hairy I mean, yeah, Old Field Aster. Absolutely. Hairy. <laughs> um. But it's also uh, it's also known as frost aster, um, and I'll get into more of the names a little bit. Um, but the reason why I chose it is because I was so glad I left it because when the flowers came out in the fall, and it's and it's like that right now, it is just covered in pollinators, uh, bumblebees, little mm-hmm. uh, solitary bees, honeybees, and and at this time of the year, I'm a beekeeper, and at this time of the year, the bees are like really looking for stuff to eat okay and to have a plant that is just bursting with flowers this late in the year is pretty special and so i was like well that's very cool so now i definitely don't ever cut it i once it completely dies back i can cut it to the ground and just come back up again and now it's in a few other places in the yard but it, it it's really pretty some people might think it it's a little scraggly i think it's beautiful and the Bees love it, and it's really good for. So that's why I chose it as my plant today because it's it's great for pollinators, and I think it's a looks good. And your self discovery, in, indeed, indeed, that process. <laughs> I mean, is that's awesome. They're like yeah. any plant that the bees are hanging out at. It's a good plant, <laughs> indeed, indeed. So uh, I'll get into a little bit now. Some of the, I, I told you earlier that the that the scientific name has kind of a similar story to yours, and so it is called scientific name is. Symphiotrichum pilosum. And symphio means growing together, and trichum means hairs. Okay. And this comes from some, I think he was a Dutch guy named Christian Gottfried Daniel Ness von Essenbach. Hmm. Um, and he was looking at asters growing in the New World. And he thought he was realizing that they were different from the asters that grow in Europe and Asia. And he, the main thing he, he like zoomed in on was that, so these also have uh, um, seeds kind of like dandelions are much smaller, mm-hmm. but they float in the wind. And those okay. are called the pappus. That's the, the scientific name for a floating seed. Um, and he noticed that the hairs growing on the pappus were growing together in a ring. And so that's why he called it symphotrichum hairs growing together. And then pelosum, which is the species name, just means hairy. And these, this this plant, the hairy old field aster, has hairs kind of all up and down it. Um, what is funny, though, is that that hairs growing in a ring around the base of the flower, I, he was mistaken. Like, it's not a common thing. Maybe whatever he was looking at had that, right. but it's not, it's not common to the genus at all. Now that he he came up with his name Symphiotrichum pilosum in the 1800s, but no one started using it because up until that up until not that long ago, everyone was just calling this plant and lots of other plants that are in the same genus in North America, uh, calling them asters because there's a genus called aster, and okay. an aster uh, is a genus of flowers in the family Asteraceae. Um, and there's a lot of flowers in that. Dandelions are in that genus. Sunflowers are in that genus. Um, asters and the, and the main characteristic of them is you look at a a, a dandelion or a, a sunflower is the best example. They are compound flowers. So a sunflower has these ray florets. Those are the big flowers that you look at. But in the yeah. middle, there's hundreds or thousands of tiny flowers. So it's not one flower. It's 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 hundreds of flowers all in one. And uh-huh. every aster has that same category. So if you look at these tiny white flowers on my plant, which I'll, I'll send you a picture they have that same category. They have these little white ray florets, but in the middle, there's several little flowers. Wow. Yeah. Now, this is where it gets, it's, gets funny again. Um, in, the, in, the, in 1994, scientists were doing an assessment of all the asters, and they just finally decided through various uh, DNA and genomic analysis and also just studying them, they decided that the things we're calling asters in the new world are distinct from the asters in Europe. Mm. 
and they decided to give them their own genus. So only in 1994, they said these are no longer aster. So this used to be called aster pelosum. But they decided to give it its own genus. But there is a rule, and I have a quote from this uh, one of the scientists who was involved in the renaming of these plants in 1994. Uh, he said, um, some of these Latini Latinized scientific names were invented and published long ago, but by the rules of nomenclature must be used. The principle of priority establishes that the first name published in a specific manner is the correct one. Symphiotrichum, uh, which displaces the more euphonious aster in the majority of these species, seems especially peculiar and tongue-twisting, and although it has almost never been used until very recently, it was first proposed in 1832 and can't be denied its rightful place. So this guy back in the 1800s, he proposed the name Symphiotrichum, even though it's not accurate, but because he accurately proposed it, when scientists have finally decided to differentiate them by the rules of nomenclature they had to use that name even though it is not accurate that's in its crazy. description <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy yeah so i thought that was funny um so there's this whole genus now i think there's hundreds of species in north america that are under sophiotrichum um and and they don't have any like that doesn't mean anything to them but it's because this guy proposed it appropriately and he he basically was, he got dibs is what happened right right <laughs> grandfather clause <laughs> indeed what um, um how big is this plant I'm so it get, get yeah so it's it's kind of a small bush okay and it gets up to four feet tall but it's kind of spindly oh. but then it has these little flowers kind of all over it so they're yeah. they're they're about like an inch maybe smaller uh in diameter okay. white flower um and it kind of looks like uh well it's also called frost aster because it's it, it blooms so late and it can really withstand frost even. Mm. But some people say it's frost aster because if you look at a field of it, it kind of looks like it's covered in snow because you have these uh, little white flowers kind of dotted all over uh, this area. So, And yeah. is it mostly, uh, is it grow like mid-Atlantic states or pretty much yeah, everywhere? It, or? It's pretty much the whole like, basically I think most mostly everywhere east of the Rockies it can grow. So I might have seen it growing up in Virginia and Charlottesville. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Probably. And it's called, its other name is called Harry Oldfield Aster because it has the uh, tendency of growing in old fields. It's it's oh. a it's a pioneer species. So it's really good at, at like uh, growing in areas that are wasted space or areas that haven't been taken care of as much. And so it's this nice pioneer plant that can pop up in all the places. And so uh, it's normally the first plant that appears in something that's maybe becoming a little bit more rewilded um, mm -hmm. i guess so which i like that word maybe is like that yeah <laughs> pioneer plant oh yeah pioneer yeah pioneer um, plant I, that, that's awesome i like those times I'm, I'm a pioneer plant <laughs> <laughs> so so one one other interesting thing about it is that uh it is i mentioned this before it has this cat it it exhibits heteroblasty or it is a heterophilus plant which means that it changes how it looks over time Oh. And so a lot of plants kind of have the same look, they their same leaf structure through their whole life. But this one starts out as this basal rosette kind of low to the ground. And then later in its life, it changes into a bush. Wow. And then, okay. And, the, and then in the winter, it completely turns brown and dies back completely. But the root structures are still alive underground. In the springtime, that rosette will come back and then it will turn into a bush again, which is pretty cool. So it always goes from the small thing back into the bush. Yeah, and that rosette will get bigger each year because it's like storing more energy. And it can also spread gotcha. via rhizome so you can get other plants growing near it, nearby. And I think I have that going on now. There's some nearby, the original one, which I think are spreading from it. Um, but yeah, it changes. I'm trying to think of there's some other good examples of plants that are heterophilous, but I'm blanking on them now. Um, and then I think maybe the last thing to talk about this plant, and this is a little bit of theme on the show, is that definition of what is a weed? Because this plant mm. is kind of regarded as a weed. I think people don't. Li it's because people don't plant it on purpose. It just pops up in people's yards, and that's by definition, people say that's a weed. Yeah. Um, but, but I think I'm I'm getting to the point where maybe almost no plant is a weed in my opinion. Because what is a weed? Right. There are plants, <laughs> and there are plants that are introduced and can be invasive. Sure. But even those plants. They didn't do that on purpose. Like we brought them to wherever right. they they go, but but uh, frost aster or hairy oldfield aster in particular is a native plant to this part of the country. It's where it belongs. It's doing right. what it's supposed to yeah. do, growing in places that are maybe a little bit you know 
run down and, and, and providing food to pollinators. And for me, it's an amazing plant. And yeah, I'm sure my neighbors will walk by and see, whoa, this weird, like, you know, cause it, it was wherever it grows, I leave it, but it's, it's doing what it's supposed to do. And I think it's a really awesome plant that is serving its role in the environment. So I don't want to like cut it down just because it, I didn't put it there. Yeah, especially, you know, thinking about people who are spraying, like, to kill weeds, they're spraying stuff to kill plants that are supposed to be there. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I'm all for, like, cutting around, you know, things that are supposed to be there for your grass. Because it's not, grass isn't really supposed to be there. True. Yeah. And, well, <laughs> right? I mean, that's, I mean, that's what's so funny, because yeah, my grass, I've got a little, you know, I've got a small amount of lawn, I'm kind of slowly trying to, like, replace it a little bit and let yeah, things same. like this grow where, where it where it would um but even some of the the grasses we talk about as being weeds are, mm-hmm. are like native yeah and the ones that we want like kentucky bluegrass is actually not native yes uh, yeah. so so just uh, i think one of the things about this podcast for me is like helping me learn to reflect about thinking how pl- thinking maybe how the plants think and like where they belong and mm-hmm. thinking about how we can like reach more a little bit more balanced, at least in the little area that I have control over, which is sure. my yard. Yeah. yeah. Keep the weeds. Indeed. Indeed. I had my, my uh, grandma got me a sign uh, um, a few years ago because she was staying with us and uh, she was a little bit, I think, disturbed by my yard uh, oh. care <laughs> regime. But then she got me a sign that says, uh, that I put up in my backyard that says, uh, uh, pardon the weeds, I'm feeding the bees. And I was like, okay that's great that <laughs> yeah yeah cool well that's that's frost aster or hairy old field aster a late walk by robert frost when i go up through the mowing field the headless aftermath smooth laid like thatch with a heavy dew half closes the garden path And when I come to the garden ground, the whir of sober birds up from the tangle of withered weeds is sadder than any words. A tree beside the wall stands bare, but a leaf that lingered brown, disturbed, I doubt not by my thought, comes softly rattling down. I end not far from my going forth by picking the faded blue of the last remaining aster flower to carry again to you. My guest on this episode of Rootbound was Stefan Lassard. Stefan is the bassist for the Dave Matthews Band. Rootbound is hosted by Steve Oldfield Ellington. Music by Christian Kriegeskota. Fake ads by David Lani. Rootbound is a podcast about plants for when you're stuck inside, but if you can go outside, you could take a visit to a swamp and listen for the sound of the wind whistling through the Spanish moss. Figs! Now with 50% more wasps!